Um, okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you guys so much for attending and listening to us chat back and forth. So today I have Dr. Kelly Guafme here, and she's going to talk about the delay to diagnosis in ALS and how we can do better. I wanted to just give some general information. Mine's at the bottom of my screen, but I've had other people say that it's at the top. But there is a little thing that says Q&A. So if you do have any questions, please do not hesitate to type them in there. And when we are finished, we will go through, well, when Dr. Goffman is finished, we will go through the questions and answer as many as we can. So I want to in introduce Dr. Guafmi, and I am going to read it so I don't get it messed up. Um, Dr. Guafmi is an associate pro professor of neurology at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. She attended neuroscience and behavioral biology at Emory University in Atlanta, and then attended Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia, her neurology and clinical neurophysiology training was completed at the University of Virginia. Following this, she completed a neuromuscular medicine fellowship at both Brigham and Women's, Un Un Women's Hospital and Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. At the University of Virginia, she started the multidisciplinary MDA clinic and was co-director of the ALS clinic and was the fellowship director for both the neuromuscular and clinical neurophysiology fellowships. She joined VCU in January of 2019 and currently serves in the capacity of neuromuscular division chair neuromuscular medicine program director and EMG laboratory director. She sees a wide spectrum of neuromuscular patients and performs electrodiagnostic studies. Her research interests include environmental risk factors in ALS and quality of life instruments. Now that has definitely made me very tired. I don't know how you feel at all. <laughs> So Dr. Guafme, I'm going to turn the stage over to you and thank you so very much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Jerry, for that very nice introduction and thank you for the invitation to give this talk. This is a topic that is near and dear to the hearts of the VCU Health ALS Clinic uh, team. And so with that, I will go right into it. So the talk is titled, as Jerry mentioned, Delay to Diagnosis in ALS, How Can We Do Better? And just some beautiful pictures of VCU health system at the bottom of the screen there. Woo. There we go. So I do not have any relevant disclosures for this talk, and these are our objectives. So we are going to describe diagnostic delay in general in ALS, and then really drill down on the reasons for diagnostic delay, dividing it between physician and patient factors, and then briefly discuss how the region of onset of the disease influences diagnostic delay. I will then go into a little bit of the work we've done here at VCU studying diagnostic delay. And then most importantly, what are the consequences of diagnostic delay in ALS? And then hopefully ending on an optimistic note of potential solutions uh, really to try and solve this problem that we have. And this story may be familiar to anyone who attended the, the Niels meeting this past fall. This is a patient of mine. She absolutely allowed me and provided me this photo so I could include her story. So she was 42 years old and developed a left foot drop in April of 2021. So one month later, her left arm became weak. And then in June of 2021, she saw a neurologist. She actually was already established with her community neurologist who was managing her migraines. And she said at that time, my side of my body, the left side of my body is weak. And that community neurologist did not initiate any workup. Then October, 2021, Going into the neurologist office for a follow-up visit, she fell in the parking lot due to her weakness and was admitted to a community hospital out of concern of stroke. She was hospitalized nearly a month and was discharged to an acute inpatient rehab where she actually obtained a power wheelchair. Again, she did not have a diagnosis at this time. 
And the stroke workup, of course, was normal. Um, and then in December 2021, after that inpatient rehab stay, she went back to that neurologist, had an EMG, and was diagnosed with ALS. She came to us one month later, and then her ALS functional rating scale was 30 out of 48 points. I suspect most everyone on this call is familiar with that scale. It is administered every time you're in clinic. It's the primary outcome measure of, for most of our clinical trials in ALS, and it really captures the functional status at that moment in time of the patient, really asking about everything from speech and swallow function down to um, leg weakness and also breathing, for example. Then the forced vital capacity for this patient at time she presented was 30% predicted. And we test vital capacities, breathing function both upright and then have the patient lie down to test it that way. Now, as you might imagine, it, it should be 100%, right? So if we calculate it out for her age and her height and 100% um, is normal, she was at 30% when she came to us. So then to go into an overview of ALS through the lens of, of why this is hard to make a diagnosis. So as everyone on this call knows, it's a fatal neurodegenerative disease that affects skeletal muscles, resulting in progressive weakness, difficulty speaking, swallowing, and breathing. And it is rare. That's part of the problem is that people don't recognize it because they don't see it every day. The incidence is estimated to be about one and a half to two per 100,000 person years and prevalence ranging five to 12 per 100,000. And it can be really hard to recognize early on, even as someone who does this all day, every day, it can be challenging to see someone and say, that's definitely going to turn into ALS or this is the very beginning. And it's heterogeneous. As you all know, no two patients look the same. Some patients start with speech problems. Some people start with a foot drop. Some people start just with shortness of breath. So it makes it very challenging. So ALS is one of these diseases where there is still a significant interval from symptom onset to time of diagnosis. It's too long. And we know that patient outcomes are improved when the, the patients are diagnosed sooner and treatments are initiated earlier. I'm really going to emphasize that towards the second half of this talk. So the diagnostic delay, there are a lot of papers on this topic. And so with that, you're going to have a range of different diagnostic delays, depending on the patient population, the country, the health system it was studied in, and so on. The range is anywhere from 9 to 27 months, though we think the average delay is 10 to 16 months, or you'll often hear 12 months sort of quoted as average. So based on one study, most patients are already in King stage two when diagnosed. What does that mean? That's two different regions involved. So like your arms and your legs or your arms and your ball bar muscles. And 40% of the disease duration has thought to have elapsed by the time the patient gets a diagnosis, which is really astounding. And again, the ALS functional rating scale revised was 37 out of 48 points at time of diagnosis in one large clinic in the US. And I'll show you our data here in a moment. And then in that same clinic, the vital capacity was around 80%, 80 out of 100, okay? So this is a great figure. Um, I actually just used it in a, another manuscript, um, looking at diagnostic delay and, and kind of where things go wrong, if you will. So starting off at the left of your screen, that's when the patient first notices there's a problem. And then it's six months before they get in to see the first physician. Usually that's gonna be a primary care doctor, right? And then from that primary care doctor on, they're gonna be referred out. They're gonna, 40% of them are going to see a non-neurologist. And we'll talk about this in detail shortly. And 60% will go on to see a neurologist. And then following that neurologist, workup will ensue. They'll get referred to an ALS specialist a lot of times or a neuromuscular neurologist, and they'll receive their formal diagnosis again around 10 to 16 months from symptom onset. So now we'll go through the reasons for diagnostic delay, starting with the physicians. 
Now, I put in the center of this slide the primary care provider, but a lot of what I'm about to say could apply to the gastroenterologist or even the general neurologist in the community. And so we can really think about why there are delays from the physician standpoint in terms of lack of awareness. They're not, they're not thinking about the disease. Maybe they're misdiagnosing the patient. Maybe they don't recognize it. They send them to ear, nose, and throat specialists instead of the neurologist. And then unfortunately, what we see all too often is a physician will say, I think this is ALS, but I'm, I'm scared to say that. Let me just refer to another doctor for further workup. Okay. That we see a lot of those sadly in our clinic where, where that provider did not, you know, have the strength to, to acknowledge their concerns. So one study suggests that primary care physicians might encounter only a single ALS patient during their entire career. So how do you educate a physician about a disease they might see once in their entire career? In one study, the decision to refer out to a specialist was delayed by five months. So those primary care providers would kind of sit on the patient for five months while they were progressing before ultimately referring them out. In one survey study, two-thirds of primary care doctors stated that their degree of training on ALS was low, and they just didn't have much knowledge regarding the clinical signs of the disease. This is a study that was just, just published this year out of the Cleveland Clinic Group, and what they did was they blasted out this survey asking primary care providers in Ohio and also um, APPs, um, advanced practice providers, so your nurse practitioners and your physician's assistants on why they think, you know, there is delay in ALS. Do you know the signs and symptoms of ALS? How would you manage these patients? And I'm not going to go through this entire paper, of course, but just to hit the highlights. 77 um, participants, survey participants, 30 of whom were APPs. So this is um, small, so I'm sorry, squint, but when asked, what are the signs and symptoms that should trigger in your mind an ALS referral? I'll tell you the blue lines here are the advanced practice providers and the green are the physicians. So not surprisingly, you know, over two thirds, three quarters of uh, respondents said muscle weakness, muscle twitching, slurred speech. But what's sort of surprising is if you get down here, you know, less than 50% of these providers recognize that cognitive and behavioral changes can be associated with ALS. And then less than a third uh, acknowledge that they, you know, emotional lability, which we see so commonly as a sign of ALS. And then where would these providers send their patients with muscle weakness? And I went into the supplementary material and I looked at the survey and they really phrased it like muscle weakness, you don't know what's causing it or someone you suspect has ALS with muscle weakness. And the vast majority, you could select more than one, but the vast majority would send to a general neurologist you know, depending on the physicians, just over a third would send to a neuromuscular specialist off the, off the um, right out of the gate, which is surprising. And then over 50% of APPs would send to a neuromuscular specialist and then kind of from there. And then what are the causes of diagnostic delay? If you ask the, pri the primary care provider, why is this happening? They say, well, the most likely explanation is the pa patient's delayed seeking medical attention, or perhaps they're not certain that the diagnosis is ALS, or, oh, it took a long time to get them in with that neurologist or the neuromuscular provider, okay? So the highlights from this paper were that less than a fifth of PCPs were confident with recognizing the signs and symptoms of ALS. Diagnostic uncertainty was the top reason for ALS diagnostic delay. Educating primary care providers and non-neurologist gatekeeper providers is most desired. These are themes you're gonna hear throughout this talk. And improving access to neurologists is also, also highly desired to curb the ALS diagnostic delay. So now going to the physician factors, specifically misdiagnosis. So just a couple of quick papers. Um, the first one from Ireland, uh, 73 motor neuron disease patients, nearly a third were initially misdiagnosed. And we'll go through you know, what diagnoses these patients received in a little more detail shortly. Um, in terms of a study, a big one from the Mass General Group, over 300 motor neuron disease patients 
over 50% were initially um, misdiagnosed. And so again, for bulbar onset, these patients are, are thought to have strokes or tumors in their brainstem or multiple sclerosis or myasthenia gravis. That's something we see as a consideration many times in these people who come in with speech and swallow problems. And I think really importantly too, non-neurological misdiagnoses. Oh, it's a vocal cord problem. Go to ear, nose, and throat. Or, oh, your, your dentures aren't fitting correctly. That's the problem. And then for limb onset, peripheral neuropathy and spine disease absolutely um, are the big ones that we see. And then I'll mention in a moment, but a lot of patients do go on to have spine surgery. Um, and then, so how about the referral to the non-neurologist? Going back to that figure I showed you at the beginning, again, about 40% will, will head over to a non-neurologist first. And so we know that's a problem because if you go to a neurologist first, that results in a faster time to diagnosis. That's not surprising, I'm sure, to anyone on this call. One study showed that only 16% of patients were first assessed by a neurologist. That was one study with 50% of those patients getting a diagnosis right away. And then one UK study found that if you fast track to a neurologist, that shortens the diagnostic time by 50%. So if you can get to a neurologist, you're going to be in better shape. And again, where do these, uh, these patients go? Ball bar patients go to gastroenterologist ear, nose, and throat, and stroke neurologist, and then limb onset patients who have arm or leg weakness often will be sent to physical therapy or orthopedics or spine surgeons or hand surgeons. And now we're going to look at the patient factors. So as you might imagine, um, patients' illness behavior is impacted a lot by who the patient is, right? Their personality, their psychological comorbidities, their socioeconomic factors, and their age. And that's just how they're going to engage with the healthcare system in general and how they're going to view their health. So many patients might not seek medical attention up until six months. So they might sit at home developing weakness of their right hand for up to six months before they call that doctor and say, I need to get checked out. We do know that those with lower incomes might have greater diagnostic delay and cognitive changes also might influence this. So really to break this down also by site of onset, which I've already alluded to a bit in some of the prior slides. So as you likely know, about a third of our patients will have the ball bar onset form of the disease where it's speech and swallow function that's impacted. So these, I mean, in a positive way, I suppose, these patients do find neurologists in a diagnosis sooner than those with limb onset. And that's because they're sicker, right? If you can't swallow, your, your workup is going to be expedited to some extent. And so the shorter diagnostic delay is seven to 10 months compared to 10 to 22 months for those with limb onset. And again, as I already mentioned, where do these patients go? Ear, nose, and throat, GI, and stroke. And what's the implications? If you can't speak, if you can't swallow, you're not getting to us in the multidisciplinary clinic. And so you might have significant weight loss by the time you get to us. You might be malnourished. There's going to be delay in potentially placing a feeding tube in you if that is your desire. And then that could ultimately impact your survival and quality of life. So the the... Most of the rest of the patients have limb onset, again, arm or leg uh, weakness as their initial manifestation, and they have a slightly longer delay to diagnosis. So um, one study showed three to five month delay for the limb onset patients specifically to seek medical attention. And then physician delay accounts for the remaining delay in these patients, right? They're going all over the place, as I already mentioned, to spine surgeons and hand surgeons and so on. And then all the time, we see that they're mistaken for spine disease or per perhaps peripheral neuropathy, and up to 10% will undergo surgery. And one study, I think this is really key, shows that non-neurologists will order an EMG in these patients 20% of the time, whereas a neurologist will order an EMG in these types of patients 75% of the time. And so really, that's the key. Maybe we should be spreading the word that everyone needs an EMG because then we will capture these patients more quickly. And then finally, respiratory onset, which makes up a very small minority of our patients. They present purely with, with shortness of breath and shortness of breath with lying down and shortness of breath with exertion. 
Um, a lot of times they have more, we'd say lower motor neuron signs, so atrophy fasciculations for sure, often middle-aged men and often associated with a lot of weight loss. And, and these patients really get a run around, even though they're quite sick, right? So the first thing anyone's going to think is they have a lung problem or heart disease causing their shortness of breath, especially if you don't have obvious weakness in your arms and legs in the beginning. And so this is delayed to access of not, um, non-invasive ventilation, and that could have a significant impact on survival as well. And so now I'm going to pivot just a little bit to our experience at VCU and why we got interested in this in this problem to start with. So in Richmond, Virginia, and I'll show you some slides here in a moment, we are fortunate enough to take care of a lot of African-American patients. And we noticed um, over the last few years that our African-American patients were presenting with more advanced disease as evidenced by the, the case I showed you at the beginning of this talk. And this is resulting in delayed access to non-invasive ventilators and feeding tubes and, and really inability to qualify for clinical trials as well. So, I mean, that's a very sad conversation to have shortly after saying, yes, you have ALS, I'm so sorry, but also, you know, there are sort of more limited things we can offer you that might come in past the point we could safely put a feeding tube in, right? Uh, and so we retrospectively looked back at the baseline characteristics of our white and African-American patients that came in to our clinic from 2017 onward. And of course, this was done um, also during the pandemic. And so that limited our ability in some ways to capture some of the um, vital capacity data. But um, here we go. So before we get into our actual results, it's, it's important to think about how prevalent ALS is in our African-American um, population. And so going back to the 2016, the National ALS Registry data, three quarters of ALS patients were, are white, 6.5% identified as black and 13% as unknown. And so there has not been a lot published on this topic. Um, the biggest study for sure was published out of the Emory Group um, back a couple years ago. And they did find that in their African-American ALS patient population, there was greater diagnostic delay. They had lower ALS FRS scores at time of presentation lower vital capacity scores at time of presentation as well. And then there was another study that was published out of the Wake Forest group that looked at survival. And then initially looking at their patient population, the black patients appeared to have a longer survival than the white patients if the outcome was death, but not significantly so if the outcome was death or tracheostomy and invasive ventilation. So it sort of it sort of evened out. And the reason was more of the Black patients were choosing to proceed with tracheostomy and permanent ventilation than the white patients, 16 versus 5%. Now, this is Richmond right here. All of you are likely familiar. Um, in the city proper, it's about 45% white and 46% Black population. And then in the metropolitan statistical area, it's more two-thirds uh, white uh, population and 30% black population. There you go. And then this is a busy slide and I'm, I'm sure all of my mentors would be screaming at me for including this right now, but I just want to draw your attention to a few data points on here. We looked at age of diagnosis, gender site of onset, diagnostic delay, and then our white patients versus our African-American patients and our overall performance. And so you'll just see at the very top here, hopefully you can see my cursor, we analyzed data from 174 white patients, 35 African-American patients, and we found in terms of diagnostic delay that our white patients were experiencing a mean diagnostic delay of nearly 13 months. So probably a little bit um, longer than you would expect compared to averages across the country, I would imagine. And then more concerningly, our African-American patients were experiencing a delay of 15.8 months. So you had a 55% increase in your uh, diagnostic delay if you are an African-American patient, which is clearly statistically significant. Looking at performance on the ALS functional rating scale, this is again from time of presentation initially to us, nearly uh, 40 points for our white patients and 33.9, so 
34 points for our African American patients. So they were presenting with a 5.6 points lower score on the ALS functional rating scale, which is definitely statistically significant as well. And then moving over to the forced vital capacity data. So similar to the study I quoted earlier, our white patients had a vital capacity of 81% at time of initial presentation compared to just under 65% for our African-American patients. And this too is quite statistically significant. So the limitations are definitely limitations with the study and we're actually analyzing a larger data set right now um, the sample size is limited. Only having 35 African American patients, you know, is a limitation of this study. The pandemic did prevent us getting initial vital capacities on many patients during those years. We did not control for socioeconomic status, nor did we um, track uh, the staging at time of diagnosis, which which certainly we should do moving forward. And then, of course, selection bias, right? We only analyzed those patients who made it to us. There are many patients who don't. And we didn't look at survival. That was not the goal of this analysis. It certainly would be a goal for some future work. But for this data set, we did not do that. And so why does it matter, right? The most important take-home points of, of this entire talk, what are the consequences here? And so if we have a patient who has a timely diagnosis, they're going to get earlier access to disease modifying therapies, access to rehabilitative care, access to nutritional support, access to respiratory support, and access to clinical trials. And so <clears throat> many of these things are housed under that multidisciplinary care umbrella, which we are going to talk about. Um, this is an amazing figure from a paper that was published in our big neurology journal just, just under a year ago. Um, Dr. Mitsumoto, Dr. Kasarkis, and Dr. Simmons uh, published this, this paper talking about the need to recognize ALS more quickly and the consequences of diagnostic delay. And so there's a lot packed in here, and I think it's so important. If you remember nothing else, I think this is the most important thing. So as you might imagine, just like other neurodegenerative diseases, the disease starts way before the patient experiences their first symptom, right? So what's happening in the background is your motor nerves are becoming damaged, but your body is able to compensate. So you're re-innervating, so you're compensating for that destruction and damage to the motor neurons. But at some point, your body's ability to compensate uh, is outpaced by the damage to the motor neurons. And that's when you reach your symptom onset. That's when you notice your first symptom. And then what happens from symptom onset to diagnosis? Again, you're outpacing the, the Degeneration is outpacing your compensatory reinnervation. And so your motor nerve um, function and, and health here on the y axis is declining. Okay. So here we are at diagnosis. This is time, of course. So red here is the person who comes to us with an early diagnosis. We capture them quickly. And then, red arrow here, we're able to start treatment early. And then you notice the sooner we start treatment, the more viable, healthy motor neurons we can, we can rescue, more or less. How about the person who has diagnostic delay? This sort of dark blue arrow here. Okay, well, we, we diagnose them. They're more advanced in their disease at that point. We start them on treatment. And we do notice some slowing of progression once the treatment is started, but it, we're not catching up to the patient who was diagnosed earlier. And then how about this dotted line here? This is the person who never started treatment, right? So I always say to my patients, the idea behind these disease modifying therapies, if we're going to take this, this progression of your disease on this trajectory, and we basically want to try and flatten it out as much as we can and slow down the progression. But if you choose not to take treatments, which is, of course, your decision, the decline is going to continue on the same trajectory. And then again, some busy slides, but just to really emphasize the importance of getting medications in these patients 
sooner. This is a recent say. This was just, you know, um, published online probably the end of 2022 in Muscle and Nerve, which is our big uh, neuromuscular journal, looking at Rilazole. So you're saying to me, Rilazole was FDA approved in 1995. Why are we still looking at Rilazole data? So I'm not sure how many people on the call are familiar with the PROACT database, this pooled resource open access AOS clinical trials consortium database, where it, looking at all these different randomized placebo controlled trials, you're looking at the placebo cohort that never received the study drug. And a lot of them are on background Rilazole, right? Because it's standard of care and you're allowed to be on standard of care in most trials um, when you go into it. And so I'm gonna spare you the um, complexities of this statistical analysis, because the, when they analyzed it this way, they didn't know exactly when the patient started the Rilazole, but they presumed that was between when they had their diagnosis and when they came into the clinical trial, they got enrolled, right? That makes sense. And so they sort of used that as a surrogate for when they started the Rilazole. But what they found was if your Rilazole start time after onset, six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, all the way down to no Rilazole, you notice that the median survival from onset in months um, is greatest. I mean, clearly it's, it's linear. Greatest if we start the Rilazole very soon. 40 months median survival, if you start Rilazole at six months after symptom onset, down to 34 months median survival if you never start Rilazole, okay? And that's new. this is a newer analysis. Let's look at a newer drug, right? So some data from the long-term survival of participants in the Centaur trial, which many of you are aware, is the pivotal phase two clinical trial looking at sodium phenylbutyrate, terucidiol, or uh, relivrio, as we now call it, in ALS. And then just remember, um, in this phase two, patients were randomized either, you know, um, to relivrio, 89 versus 48 placebo. And then after six months, those on placebo were allowed to roll over to the study drug in an open label extension. And so what did they find? So the median survival duration was 25 months for those who initially got the drug right off the bat and 18.5 months for those who were initially randomized to placebo. So those most of those patients in the placebo arm ultimately got the drug, but they did not catch up, okay? So it was a 6.5 month difference in terms of survival between those two groups. And then the estimated probability of survival at 24 months was 51.6% for those who first got the drug and 34% for those who first got the placebo. Again, they just don't catch up. And the treatment arm had a mean of 10.6 months uh, exposure to the drug and the placebo group had a mean of 4.7 months, an average of 4.7 months exposure to drug. Again, just showing you the difference in the time of exposure to drug results in change in uh, survival expectancy um, expectations. And so the take home point is if you're exposed to Relivrio earlier, then the greater survival benefits likely due to those neuroprotective qualities of this drug. And I could quote you a number of other studies. I mean, we know this is true as well for a Daravone or Radicava. We think this is likely true for the stem cell treatments too. Sooner is better and has more impact. And so again, what are the consequences? If we can capture these patients sooner, then they have earlier access to multidisciplinary care. And many of you on this call are likely followed in a multidisciplinary care center, you know the importance of this, right? You have access to not just the physician, but a whole bunch of therapists who are specialized in ALS, social worker, respiratory therapist, genetic counselor, and so on. And so why does it matter? I often tell patients, you know, this is a long study, this is a long visit today, isn't it? So it's three to four hours. Why are we doing all this? It's because it helps, it works. And we have just a little bit of data I can share with you uh, on why and how it works. So in Italian say this is going back to 2006, looked at patients who were either followed in an ALS clinic or in a standard neurology clinic. And not surprisingly, those who went to the ALS clinic had increased utilization of Rilazole back in 2006, right? That's what we had. Um, increased access to non-invasive ventilation and feeding tubes and less admissions to the hospital, right? We try very hard to keep our patients out of the hospital. 
And then not surprisingly, survival was longer, right? If you're followed in a specialty clinic like a multidisciplinary center, you're, we know what we're doing, we think, um, and we we do our best to really take good good quality care of these patients. And so it was just over a thousand days survival um, in the multidisciplinary care setting versus just over 775 days if you were not followed in that setting. So longer survival if followed in an ALS clinic. And then looking at an Irish study, again, you are more likely to have access to Rilazole and then also showing that being followed in that clinic was an independent predictor of survival and reduced the risk of death by 47% in a five-year study. And then the Dutch also looked at this and compared their patients in a multidisciplinary setting compared to a neurology setting, general neurology setting, and those patients in the multidisciplinary clinic got access to equipment more. They had a higher quality of life as well. And then finally, a more recent study looking at the cost savings. So this is a European study out of um, Ireland. An expedited referral to the multidisciplinary ALS clinic would have a reduced cost by an estimated over 2,000 pounds per patient, right? So we're saving the patient money as well by putting them into this model sooner. So take home points. Earlier access to multidisciplinary care improves survival, access to medications, access to nutrition and respiratory support, mobility devices, quality of life, and we get to save money. So how are we going to tackle this problem, right? I I've, I've hope I have described to you the scope of the problem and the impact of the problem, but what are the potential solutions? Again, a busy slide. This is a table taken directly out of that same article published in Neurology in 2022. I'm really focusing on this problem. I don't expect anyone to read this, but I'm going to use this to pull out some extremely important themes. So what are the recommendations? We need to educate the general physicians and the surgeons and the EMGers on the signs and symptoms of ALS so they recognize them and make that referral. We need to educate the patients, um, which is part of why we're giving this talk right now, right? On the importance of initiating treatment early. If that treatment is access to multidisciplinary care, if that treatment is Relivrio or Rilazole or what have you, and then we also need to improve our diagnostics. And I'm just going to touch on this a, a little bit in a few moments. Um, that's, that's part of the problem, right? There's no easy blood test for ALS. If we had that, a lot of these problems would go away. And then we need to improve access. As many of you know, in the United States, it takes forever to get in to see a neurologist. And that contributes to the diagnostic delay. And we need to spread the word of the problem, right? We need to emphasize and highlight that this is a problem and we need to do something about it. And so what types of interventional strategies can we consider to educate both patients and providers? So community outreach programs, um, you know, trying to educate the public, the patients, the providers about the red flag symptoms of ALS. When should you be thinking about ALS? Could we build decision support software and diagnostic guidelines and algorithms into our electronic medical records? That would be amazing. And so just to highlight a few tools. So the ALS Association and the Time to Diagnosis work group, Working Group developed this Think ALS tool. And, um, and I'll show you in a minute, but we use this tool on a daily basis in the, in the Richmond area. And it's really, it was developed to be used by the general neurologist. And I, I personally want to do better and have the primary care providers use this tool and think about ALS and make that referral before they get to the general neurologist, okay? So if you haven't seen this before, this is, this is it. It's very distilled down. So if you have limb onset features or ball bar onset features, um, then, and you say yes to any of those, and then if you have, you know, one of these other supporting features of ALS, like a family history of ALS, of course, then we want to route that person to be evaluated by an ALS specialist. If you have a lot of pain, you know, for example, um, that is less likely to be ALS and in, into a category D. And so that might move you away from thinking about ALS. And so it just is really a simple tool to guide the provider in thinking about ALS and making the appropriate referral quickly. 
And then um, the Europeans have a similar tool, this red flag diagnosis tool from the Motor Neuron Disease Association, which again is just sort of asking, do you have bulbar symptoms, respiratory features, limb features, cognitive features? If yes, and is there progression? Yes, then let's think about sending that patient over to get um, to a specialist quickly. And then how can we improve the diagnostics, right? This is something that a lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about. And the reason is, you know, it's just taking too long and we don't have great, great commercially available diagnostic biomarkers. Our diagnostic criteria, um, you know, is challenging. We've been using the revised allosporial criteria for many years, and a lot of patients have ALS and don't meet probable or definite criteria off of Ellis Scorial. So as you may know, in 2020, the Gold Coast criteria was published. Jeremy Scheffner was the lead author on this. And the idea is, again, can we do better? Can we capture these patients sooner? And a lot of times, you know, this is going to be used both clinically and in clinical trials. But some of the differences with the Ellis Scorial, I mean, this is true for possible Ellis Scorial, but you need upper and lower motor neuron dysfunction in one body region. But they're also now counting if you have pure lower motor neuron dysfunction in two body regions as consistent with ALS, which was not in the ls Goriel criteria. And I'm just going to show that to you here, that again, we're kind of allowing some additional patients that would have been weeded out with ls Goriel to be diagnosed through the Gold Coast criteria. And then there's just this paper briefly that looked to see if the Gold Coast criteria is performing better than the ls Goriel criteria. And this was out of the Netherlands and Belgium. And in and, and summary, they did find that about 10% of their patients could be diagnosed using Gold Coast criteria um, instead of ls Goriel criteria. So their diagnostic yield was a bit higher, right? There was actually 1.6% who fulfilled revised ls Goriel, but not Gold Coast criteria. So overall progression rate and median survival time remain somewhere between um, the two groups. Diagnostic biomarkers, I mean, I feel like this is something we've been striving for for a long time. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there are several studies, as, as some of you may know, looking at specifically uh, neurofilament heavy and light chains, both in spinal fluid and in blood, that can be used as diagnostic biomarkers. Promise they're nonspecific. I could rattle off a list of different neuropathies, for example, that are associated with elevated um, neurofilament light chains, but it may help assist with differentiating patients with ALS from other conditions and might actually even increase prior to time of diagnosis. Now, um, I will say that this is being used also as kind of an outcome measure, if you will, uh, in clinical trials, um, especially the Tofferson trial um, that is in the news quite a bit right now. Okay, so how can we tackle this? improved access. So just a, a moment on what we're doing here at VCU. So we are rolling out this ALS rapid access pilot program, we're calling it. Um, we have had a webinar, um, again, addressing kind of the general um, providers in the community, um, the general medicine doctors, and then we invited them to attend. We basically did brief education on ALS, brief education on the diagnostic delay issue in our region, and then we introduced them to this rapid access pilot program where if they are concerned at all that their patient has ALS when they assess them in clinic, they can route them directly to me and I will see them within four weeks and hopefully bypass having them go to general neurology, orthopedics, spine surgeons, and so on, and having unnecessary MRIs and so on. So the brochure for the clinic you see on the right of your screen, again, too small to read, but just basically what is ALS? What is this program? How do I get my patient into it? And then on the back of this brochure, we have the Think ALS tool. So it's handy for the providers. We've also mailed these um, these brochures out all over the region. Um, and it's starting to work, right? So these patients are starting to make their way to us with just symptoms concerning for ALS without having had other diagnostic workup yet. So it is starting to work. And so finally, how can we tackle this? We need to spread the word that this is a problem. There is something we can do about it. And the consequences of diagnostic delay are, are real, right? And so we want to do better by our patients and get them access to the multidisciplinary care, the medicines, as well as clinical trials sooner. 
And with that, I have covered the, the objectives I introduced to you um, at the beginning of the talk. And then I just want to say thank you to my amazing team here at VCU. I couldn't do it without you. Um, you inspire me every day. You are my partners in this work. I also want to thank the amazing group of people who help us do all the prior authorizations for these new medications for our patients. They work tirelessly also behind the scenes to support our patients. And I don't think they get enough credit for all the good work they do. And then finally, I want to thank the patients. Thank you for inspiring me every day to do better and work harder and find answers and better care for you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was that was really informative and I appreciate your time. So guys, if you have any questions, please go to your question and answer um, bar at the end of mine's at the bottom. So we'll see right now we don't have any questions. We'll wait to see if we get any. So with the rapid access, you know me, I've always got questions. With the, <laughs> with the rapid access, then I'm seeing that because you sent this information out, you're starting to see increases in that. In that. That's fantastic. It is. Yeah, no, we're starting to see those first patients come in. And I recognize the names of the primary care providers and they... They say this patient has slurred speech, route directly to Dr. Guathme for evaluation for possible ALS. And so they hadn't gotten their brain MRI, they haven't gotten an EMG, they haven't had a swallow study, none of that workup has been done. And so I, I um, recently was talking with someone else about this, but one of those patients who came in about two weeks ago, I mean, he was four months into his symptom onset of ball bar dysfunction. And so to me, if I can get this gentleman diagnosed I've got to do a little workup, but within five months, I mean, that's, that's a victory right there, right? It we is. just cut that diagnostic delay in half. So um, we'll see. We really want to analyze some of this on the back end to see if this model is helping. I sure hope it is, um, but we do want to actually, you know, systematically study it to, to show that. This is an excellent question. And Mandy, thank you so much. From an advocate standpoint, what can we do to help? I'm part of a small crew of advocates that want to help raise awareness about the issues of delays in diagnosis. Thank you for this presentation. It's great. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I, I think that is important. I, I think from your standpoint, who are you advocating to? Is it the medical community? Is it other, you know, the general population? I think there are a lot of different ways we can target these different audiences. Um, I'll be honest with you, just raising awareness amongst the general population is important too. So we're going to try and take some of our work to the news outlets, the local ones, just so that we can get the word out there even more so. But I have patients multiple patients who have emailed me directly before they've been diagnosed saying, I have researched my symptoms and I'm worried about myself. And can I please come see you? And they're usually right, right? So if we can just spread the word amongst just everyone, in addition to the medical providers, I think that's so important. So um, I don't know, Facebook or social media, however you want to get the word out there would be greatly appreciated. And then also the other important thing is, if you are friends with other patients, you know, do they realize the importance of getting, you know, I think on these medications and getting into multidisciplinary care and the benefits with that? I think there are a lot of patients out there that don't realize um, the value that that type of care model brings as well as the, the medication. So. So we have another question. Why do you feel EMGs are so infrequently recommended? Is it cost, unfam unfamiliarity, et cetera? It seems to be critical for ALS. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I honestly think from a general practitioner standpoint, they don't realize the value of them. If you think about it, most primary care providers have never seen an EMG. They have not had an EMG done to them. They don't know why they would necessarily want to order an EMG. Um, and so that's a missed opportunity. So we think there could be some additional education around using, saying this is a tool to use 
you know, please consider it sooner, you know, in your in your evaluation. Um, I think EMGs get a bad rap, right? Um, a lot of people find that they're uncomfortable, and so they don't want to subject their patients to a painful procedure if it's not necessarily going to be helpful. But what you'll see, you know, in the subspecialties, like in spine and um, hand surgery, we order EMGs all the time. Like non-primary um, care providers order EMGs quite frequently. And so we, we have a low threshold and we understand the benefit and the value in doing that. And I always say as an EMGer, if you're an EMGer, you order EMGs because you know how valuable they are. So it really is just sort of a knowledge gap, I think, with the primary care providers. So this is part two of the first question, I would say. And she states, part of our outreach is to host ALS panels for medical students. What would you want them to know? I love that. Yeah, no, that's, that is fantastic. So um, yes, get to them when they're still young and their eyes are open and they're not too tired. Um, yes, I mean, I want everyone to realize that ALS is not the same disease it was 10 or 15 years ago. I think we have a lot more tools in our toolkit that we need to put to use. And it's just a matter of how we get our tools to the patients in the right amount of time. And so I think if we can just emphasize that to these medical students, the signs and symptoms, like burn that into their brains um, so they don't miss it, right? They don't miss it. I think every medical student should rotate through an ALS clinic at least once, just so they can see the patient so they'll never forget. And then remind them that this is a disease that we can treat. Because again, in the community, a lot of providers don't realize that. So thank you for doing that. Good work. That's excellent. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Does taking multiple medications, all the R's, cumulatively increase survival times? And she says, thanks for an excellent presentation. Yeah, thank you. That's a question we get asked all the time. And the, the short answer to this is we don't have data yet, um, right? Because Relivrio was FDA approved on September 29th of, of last year. Um, my personal opinion and the way that I practice medicine is that they all work differently, right? They're targeting different pathways that go awry to ultimately result in ALS and motor neuron cell death. So, you know, if we can target these different pathways with different drugs, then it follows that in combination, these drugs are going to have a synergistic benefit that should result in improved survival and slower progression. So we are pretty aggressive. We hit our patients, you know, with all three, if, if insurance allows us to, if they tolerate them. And so far, again, anecdotally, anecdotally, you know, patients were catching soon, you know, early after symptom onset and, and treating aggressively have been doing quite well. And I think overall, I mean, we would need to pull our numbers, but our patients are, are doing much better now than they did five years ago, 10 years ago in terms of survival and rate of progression. So Donald says, can you speak a little more, more about why the disparity in diagnosis for white men versus other racial groups? Is this just sampling bias? I mean, it, I suppose it could be sampling bias. I mean, we, you know, are going to continue to look at this. I mean, the concern is, is it access? You know, is it, you know, financial? Is it, you know, where these subpopulations live. I, I don't know. Is it fear of the healthcare system? There are a lot of different factors that could be playing into it. Implicit bias on the part of the provider. Um, I think, you know, regardless, if we can sort of emphasize that this is a problem, and then hopefully sort of again, train everyone around us to think about it, especially in our African-American patients, then we can get them diagnosed sooner and bring them in under our umbrella and get them the treatment that they need. But yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. There are a lot of different factors likely at play. Okay, that was our last question. Anybody else have any questions you wanna put in the question and answer box before we end? Dr. Guafmi, it's always, always a pleasure working with you. And I just want to thank you so much for doing this. This was, this was great. As many people commented, this was really great. And I really thank you. So right now, we don't have any more questions. So unless you have a, a ending comment to make, 
I think we will thank everybody and a special thank you to you. Wonderful. No, just thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm quite passionate about this work and happy to take any questions offline, uh, of course. So thank you. Well, you're awesome. And thank you so very, whoop, wait a second. Oh, a thank you. Another <laughs> thank you there. Thought we had a question. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody. We will be doing this again next month. Next month is going to have a respiratory side um, discussion on, on our webinar. So I look forward to, um, well, not seeing everybody, but seeing everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Gwathmi. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye, everybody.